I'm excited to be back in the book of Joel. How many of you are looking forward to digging in deeper into the minor prophets? I, I love this book, and I'm excited about the message this morning. And I'm excited about our current sermon series, Believe, Belong, Become, The Day of the Lord is at Hand. Now, I could not think of a more perfect message, a better message for our church at this time than this one right here. And here's the reason why. God has been good to our church. I believe that with all, I love our church. I'm excited about what God is doing at West Florida Baptist Church. Are you as well? Okay, are you as well? <laughs> Man, God has been blessing our church. He's been moving and working. I, I could go on. I'm excited about the fact that, that we are going to add a third service at the beginning of the new year because this place is filling up. I, I love seeing how full it is every Sunday morning. Man, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about our missions project that we get to be a part of, the Philippines Heritage Project. And I just want to remind you that in two weeks from today, we're going to be taking up an offering and your commitments for the next year. And it's exciting to be a part of what God's doing here and also around the world. I'm excited about dreaming and planning and working towards building a new auditorium and making room for more people. I mean, I could go on and on. I'm excited about the spirit that I believe is here. There's, there's an incredible spirit in our church. I genuinely love our church. I love you guys. I, I love seeing you every week. I like the joy, and I, I love knowing how God's moving and working. And there, there seems to be a genuine spirit of anticipation every single week at what God's going to do and how he's going to speak to people through his word, and it's exciting to be a part of that. I, I love the fact that that our church hasn't just been growing with younger couples, but with older couples. We, we have a multi-generational church. And we don't, we don't have just, I'm not going to say old people, okay? We have older people. But we also have younger people and young families and, and babies that are being born. And it's exciting to see people of every generation here gathered together worshiping. Hey, that, that's a church that God can get in and breathe in and he can continue to use. But what I get excited about the most is that what's happening is people are believing in Jesus and his transforming power. Hey, two weeks from today, we're having a baptism Sunday, and we've got some incredible testimonies of what God's doing in people's lives, and it's exciting, and people are belonging to his church. I mean, we just finished a starting point class. We've got another one that's coming up in two weeks as well, and I think we had like 15 families join our church as a result of the, the last starting point class, and people are becoming what God created you to be. You're taking next steps, and, and you're growing like even Casey was talking about this morning. She got out of her introverted self and put herself out there and was able to connect with people. That's a big deal. Take those steps. Continue to let God move and work in your heart and in your life. And so I, I could not, though, think of a better message than going to the prophets and going to a phrase like, the day of the Lord is at hand. Because as a church, we cannot, we must not become complacent or comfortable with where we are at. There is way too much at stake, and we must continue to press forward for God's honor and for God's glory. So we're in the book of Joel. Joel is a prophet. And what we know about the prophets is they have been given a word from the Lord that needs to be taken very seriously. And the more that I jump into this book and the more that I'm learning about prophecy as a whole is that it is so relatable to where we are all at today. It's relatable. I'm going to give you a quick lesson, okay? You can write these three words down if you want to. But whenever you're reading one of the prophets, whenever you're dealing with prophecy, you have to understand these three things. They're always dealing with something immediate, something that was at hand. There, there is a, a cultural context, okay? There's something immediate. They're also dealing with something that's imminent, something that is about to happen, something that is coming. And then they are also dealing with something ultimate, such as the day of the Lord, the day of all days when the Lord is going to return. So you see all of that perfectly here in the book of Joel. Something is here. Something was immediate. Two weeks ago, we were in Joel chapter one, and we were talking about the great locust invasion. Has anybody been looking and thinking about locusts a little bit differently since then? I mean, they got those big old jaw teeth, and God used these little bugs, these little insects to devastate an entire land. So they have an immediate crisis that they're dealing with. But in Joel chapter two, he's not providing any relief. 
He's not saying that, hey, this crisis is about to be done. He's saying if, if you don't wake up and pay attention, something greater is about to happen, something far worse than even what you're experiencing right now. Something is imminent. Something is, is about to happen and take place in your life. And then next week, we're going to look at the ultimately, how it's all going to end, that there's going to be an event that's going to come one day, and it's going to happen like a thief in the night where God is going to return, and he's going to judge this earth, and he is going to make every single wrong right. And for a child of God, that is a day that we can look forward to. That is a day that we can anticipate. But for those that do not know God, wow, that's a day that we need to take seriously. And so the title of my message this morning is Scared to Life. Scared to Life. Have you ever been scared to life? I'm not talking about scared to death. Scared to death is when you become paralyzed in fear and you can't respond or react. I'm talking about have you ever been scared to life? When Alana and I first got married... We had probably been married for a couple of months, and we got home. I think it was a Sunday night, actually, after church, and it was just, it was probably around this time of year even because it was getting dark, so it was like not completely dark, but it was dusk, and she gets out of the car on the driver's, on her side of the door, the passenger side, and she goes down the sidewalk, and she rounds the corner, and she's just out of my sight. I'm getting out of the car, and I'm coming around the front, and all of a sudden, I hear the scariest, loudest scream that I have ever heard in my entire life. You want to talk about a blood-curdling scream, the kind of scream that your heart goes from like here all the way down to your toes in like one second. And I praise God that in the moment of truth, I wasn't scared to death. I didn't jump back in the car and drive away and leave her hanging all by herself. I mean, I was scared to life. I jumped into action, okay? So I, I'm proud that when I was faced with that moment, I jump into action. I go flying around the corner. I'm expecting an intruder. I'm expecting to be met with this scary life or death moment, and I don't see anything. And she's standing there, and she says, it's a cockroach. <laughs> you want to talk about God's impressive creation? I didn't know human beings could experience such a range of emotions in just a matter of seconds. I went from being scared to death to filled with rage. (laughs) Why would you do this to me? And to this day, I will say, she is a tough lady, but she is scared. She don't like cockroaches, and she doesn't like lizards. And if any of them come in our house or get anywhere near it, and I'll tell you, if you're a young couple and you're a guy and you don't want to spend that money on that pest control, just spend the 40 bucks. It'll save your marriage. It'll be a wonderful thing. All right, so there's just a little tip that I know is going to help you. But what what I will never forget about that moment was how that fear, and this is 20 years later, I'm still, it's still very vivid in my mind. I will never forget how the fear instantly brought me to life. It instantly brought you to action, scared to life. That's the idea of where we're going. And in some ways, this was the job of the prophets, to scare God's people to life. to to wake them up, to scare us to action. The day of the Lord is at hand. You know what that was? That was a a warning cry. That was a a piercing cry in the daytime to, to wake up and pay attention. If you don't stop what you're doing, if you don't repent, if you don't get things right with God, trouble is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand. God was trying to wake up the cold, dead hearts of his people and bring them back to life. And what I love about the prophets and what's awesome about the Bible and God's word is sometimes, sometimes we get this balance wrong. God is not just this God to be terrified of, to fear. He's also a God of love and of mercy. And often when we think about the prophets, we, don't, we, we think about God's wrath and his judgment, but we don't always think about the compassion and the mercy and the grace of God that's intermixed. I, I, I saw this book title this week that just really, to me, encapsulates this message in the heart of so many of the prophets. And it was called, the title of the book was Scared to Life. But then the subtitle was this, Tales of a Good God Who Reveals His Heart When Ours is Racing. And what we have to understand this morning is that amid all of our brokenness, amid all of our sin, Amid all of our self-inflicted problems, hey, there are things that happen in our lives that, that have nothing to do with anything in particular that we have done, okay? It's just the fact that we live in a broken and a sin-cursed world. But there is a whole lot of things in our lives that happen because we deserve them to happen. 
Even us as believers who know better, we don't always do what we're supposed to do, right? And even in the midst of our self-inflicted problems is a good God in heaven who's crying out to us. The day of the Lord is at hand. We need to be scared to life. So let's look at this passage this morning. Here's the first point. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Look at verse 1. He says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The idea here is there's a man on the watchtower, and he's being given signal. Uh, uh, he's being given the word from his uh, his commander to, to blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. It's long. Okay, hit the stop button. <laughs> now you know what you all need to thank God for that we can laugh when we hear that this morning. But could you imagine, like, I was just thinking about World War II, for instance, and living in, in London or somewhere like that. Could you imagine hearing those sirens and those alarms going off and knowing that something was imminent, something was about to ha happen, the fear and the terror that's coming? That, that's what's happening here in Israel. The, the prophet Joel is saying, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. Look at verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. And, and here's the, the key to this whole, chapter, this whole chapter right here. A great people and a strong, there's an army that is massing. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Joel is saying, hey, something imminent is taking place. There is an army that is forming. They're just over the border. And if you don't wake up and pay attention, there is an imminent threat. Attack is about to happen and take place. And what happened with the locusts is going to pale in comparison to what's about to happen here in chapter 2. This army that he goes on to describe in verses 3 through 9, it was unstoppable. It was capable of mass destruction. Look at verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and everybody help me read the end of that verse. What's it say? Nothing shall escape them. What's coming was going to be similar to the locusts. I mean, remember the devastation that we looked at in chapter 1? There was nothing left of the vegetation of the land. But this was going to go further and even deeper than just the vegetation of the land. Verses 4 through 9, I'm not going to read all of them, but it describes this army. You could, you could hear them coming in the distance. This army was, was big enough and powerful enough, and the alarm goes off, and the people are inside the walls of the city, but you could hear the army before you could see the army, and the fear is beginning to build. And then when they come into view and they come into the site, it's just absolutely terrifying at the strength and the might of what they were faced with. This army was disciplined. This army was organized. They were eager for battle. It talks about how they, they ran into the battle. They were ready for the fight. They were ready to overtake the city. They were eager for the fight that was in front of them. The walls of the city, they were going to be no defense for the city. They weren't going to keep them out. This army was going to scale those walls. No matter how many arrows or defense systems you put in the way, nothing was going to stop them from continuing to attack and move forward. And finally, they would overwhelm the city and they would break into every single house. So we're not just talking about the vegetation now. Now we're talking about your personal, private property, your home being completely invaded and run over and taken over. Verse 6 gives us a picture of the terror and dread that would sweep over the land. Look what it says in verse 6. It says, Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. I mean, the life just goes out of them. There's just fear, terror, terror, and dread at what they were faced with. But here's what we have to understand about this passage. God is on the move. Judgment was coming, and it was coming at the hand of God himself. Look at verse 10. It says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Something bigger than just an enemy invasion was taking place. God was intervening in human history. God himself was going to stretch out his hand, intervene in human history to get the attention and the hearts of his people, to wake them up. 
Look at verse 11, and I need you to help me with this. When I pause, you're going to read the next two words that come, okay? So here, look what it says. And the Lord shall utter what the, his voice before, for is very great. For he is strong that executeth. And then everybody with the end of the verse, help me. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Did you pick up on what we just read? The army was his army. His camp was very great. Those that execute his word, it's not going to be stopped. And it's not going to be stopped because of the people. It's not going to be stopped because it's his word that goeth forth. We are no match for God. And when he decides to take vengeance on sin, it will be a very great and a very terrible day. And here is the practical application that I want us to see this morning. Stop yawning at God. Stop yawning at God. I was reading this week and I came across a story of what happened on October 19th, 2011 in Zanesville, Ohio. The, the heading that, that caught my attention is the wild invaded the civilized. There was a man by the name of Terry Thompson and he was the local, the local owner, the owner of a local <laughs> zoo. Thank you, man, that took a lot. I practiced this this morning and that's what came out. <laughs> he was the owner of a local zoo. Tragically, sadly that day, he took his own life, but before he did, he released all of his exotic animals into the wild. By that afternoon, 911 starts receiving calls. They get one call, hey, there's a wolf that's by the local high school. A little while later, like outside of town on a rural road, there was another call about a mountain lion that was spotted. My favorite out of all was somebody called up 911. 911, what's your emergency? Um, there's a lion underneath the street light. I mean, could you imagine going home from a church this afternoon and on Highway 90 underneath the streetlight, there's a lion that's just standing right there just on the prowl? By evening that night, the town is in full emergency mode. There are construction signs that, had, um, that were saying, caution, exotic animals, stay in the vehicle. Probably most of you in here from Milton, Florida would get out of the vehicle and go try to find those exotic animals. You'd be excited at the adventure that's there. One person said, it's like Noah's Ark wrecking right here in Zanesville, Ohio. I mean, that was like the theme of the day. I mean, the media said, does anybody remember hearing that story on the news? I mean, nope, I didn't either. Okay, some of you do. Okay. So anyway, for one evening, the wild invaded the civilized. Suddenly, people were thinking about tigers and lions in a much more serious way. It's one thing to see them at the zoo. It's one thing to even be bored. Have you ever gone to the zoo and you kind of get bored with the lions and tigers because all they ever do is sleep? I mean, I want to see them like, I want to see them feed them and I want to see them like pouncing and doing something fun and they're just laying there and I'm like, get up, tiger, get up, lion. They don't do anything. They just lay there most of the time. But could you imagine they're all of a sudden, they're like loose in your backyard. Do you think your perspective is going to be a little bit different and a little bit changed? Here's what I want us to understand. The Bible tells us that a holy God is in our midst. The Bible describes God as the judge of all the earth. He's described in the Bible as a consuming fire in our passage that we're looking at this morning. He's the Lord of hosts. It's his army. It's his camp. It's his word. And he's poised and he's ready for battle. But unlike the citizens of Zanesville, we aren't trembling in fear. Neither are we thrilled with excitement at the prospect of meeting and knowing him face to face. And can I tell you, one day we will stand in his presence. One day we will see God. One day we're not just going to talk about him and preach about him and read about him. We will see him face to face. You know the problem with Israel? is that they, they, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't pay attention to the warnings until it was too late. And then they met God face to face in a locust invasion. And then they met God face to face when the Assyrians and the Babylonians came and wrecked and ruined their city because they failed to listen to what God was saying to get their attention. They yawned at God. When's this crazy prophet gonna leave us alone? When's he going to go away? I want to get back to my own life. I want to get back to my own situation. We can handle our problems. We can face it. They had a bad perspective of God. We're God's people. He's not going to do anything to us. They yawned at God, and they did not take him seriously. And all too often, we do the same thing. Man, when's this service going to end? 
What are we having for lunch today? Man, I can't wait to go home and watch football this afternoon. It's the start of the NFL season. How many of you got a fantasy football league? Where's the fantasy football league owners? You got your lineup set and ready to go. Listen, there's a lot of excitement that goes into these things. And I'm not saying, I like fantasy football myself. I've done it lots of years. It, it changes the way that we, we view football. But can I just remind you of what it is? It's fantasy football. Let me say that one more time. Fantasy football. And here's what I want us to understand. It is tragic, sad that we would put more emotion and more energy and more excitement into something like that than we do into our relationship with God. Because we're not talking about somebody that just can be ignored, that's just off the side. We will stand face to face with God one day, and we better wake up and pay attention to what it is, who it is that we're talking about, and what it is, who it is that we're going to be dealing with one day. We will stand in his presence, and we better fear God. He is holy. God is holy. He loves us with an unimaginable love, and he pursues us with unfathomable affection because he wants our hearts, and he's trying to tell us this morning, stop trying to do life on your own. You can't do it. You know, every time in the Bible where it says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes, you know what immediately followed that? The world was turned upside down, and it was a chaotic mess. And if we would just open up our eyes, we, we can look and we can see a world that is full of people that don't want God, that want to be left to ourselves. Hey, I know what's going to make me happy. I know what's best for me. I don't care what God's word says. I want to live right. And you know what's happening? Pure chaos. The world's falling apart right in front of our very eyes. We can't make it without God. It's impossible. And we better wake up and pay attention that we need him. And we better get on our faces before him. And we better fear him because he is holy and he is righteous and he is good and he is just. And one day we will stand before him and we will give an account for our lives. So we better stop yawning at God and we better take him seriously. Secondly, mercy is available. Judgment is coming, but mercy is available. Look at verses 12 and 13. This is where he's going with all of this. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. You know what God wanted from his people? He wanted them to turn back to him with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind and strength. Hamish gave us a wonderful message last week. If you weren't here, go back and watch it. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he commands the people to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you love the Lord your God and if you teach his word and his commandments to your children and to your grandchildren and you pass it on, then God's going to show up because he wants to work for our good always. And when we turn our backs on him and when we walk away from him, then we open ourselves up to judgment and we open ourselves up to the problems that we bring on ourselves. And he says, I want you to turn back to me with your whole heart. Love me with all of your heart, your soul and your mind and your strength because I'm a good God. You know what he's saying here? Israel, they had defied God. They had rejected God. They had yawned at God. They were comfortable. They were complacent. They didn't want to be God's special people. They, they thumbed their nose at God. They rejected him in every sense. And in spite of all of that, God says, yes, I'm going to do something to wake you up. But if you turn to me, if you repent, did you notice what he said in verse 13? He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's of great kindness. Isn't it awesome that we just got done singing that song, Just As I Am, and we can come broken, and we can come wounded. And by the way, if you are here today, and you're broken, and you're wounded, and, and you're in need of a Savior, God loves you, and he cares about you. Hey, if your heart's been hardened, and you've been straying from God, and you have gotten so far from God that you don't think he'll ever take you back, don't believe that lie from Satan. It's a lie. He loves you, and he cares about you. And you know what? He's gracious, and he's merciful. And look at verse 13, 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Even though that enemy was at the gate, 
God could still show up and do something drastic to stop that enemy and to turn it back around or to eliminate it and wipe it out. And by the way, the Bible's full of incredible stories like that. It's never too late. And I love how he says, who knows if God will return and repent. And you know what? We, we don't. God's sovereign. He does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. And who are we to question that? But you know what I know the Bible tells me over and over again? That when we humble ourselves and we fall before him, oh, he does forgive. And he does show mercy. And he is gracious. And he's full of compassion. There's an interesting paradox in this passage. You just got to take a minute to point this out because it helps us to know God in a better way. In this passage, God is the commander of the enemy army. But he's also who they need to turn to for help. So God is the enemy and he's the friend. God is dangerous, and God is safe. And it's so important for us to capture this balance. It helps us to know who God is. So many religions and so many people get it off. They they can only comprehend one side or the other. There's so many people that have no problem seeing God as this harsh judge who's mean in a sense, and, and, and they're terrified of him. There's a holy terror and dread at the thought of God. And so you know what we do? We, we keep him at arm's length and we say, man, you are holy and there's things that I can't fully understand. And so we keep him at arm's length. But there's also another error on the other side. There's this philosophy out there that, that God is so soft and merciful and loving, almost like he's a big giant teddy bear. And you can live however you want and do whatever you want, but that's okay because God's gracious and merciful and he's loving. Can I tell you, God is both. God is both. When you get on your knees and you pray, you ought to recognize the fact that you are going into the presence of a holy God. I I try to think about Isaiah 6. Man, there's smoke and there's lightning and there's angels and there's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah's on his face as dead. And I, I try to get a picture of the holiness and the greatness of God. But then at the same time, I go to the Lord's Prayer and I remember that I can say, my Father, our Father, which art in heaven. Man, and I know that Hebrews tells me that I can come boldly before the throne of grace because he doesn't see me in my sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, there needs to be an understanding of both. For the child of God, for our world, man, there needs to be a fear and a reverence and an awe at the majesty of who God is. But man, we need to embrace him as well because he is gracious and merciful and loving and he is safe and he is our deliverer and he is our help and he is our hope and he is our friend. And when the Lord is on your side and when he's the commander of the host that's fighting for you, wow, that's, that's where I want to be in my life every day. And so the practical application is this. Rend your heart. There, there was a line there in verse 13, and rend your heart and not your garments. Man, in the Old Testament, it's, you see it often where a prophet shows up or a disaster strikes, and what do the people do there? They, they rend their mantles. They tear their garments. They put on sackcloth and ashes. I mean, this is so common and familiar in the Old Testament that even in a pastor's home, the kids take it literally. I got, I got another story. I'm t- picking on my family today. One of my sons, I won't mention his name, because I don't want to embarrass him, although I might mention his name at some point in this story, but we were out in the pool one day. He was probably like 14. No, just kidding. He was more like six, young. And uh, we always have these competitions because everything has to be a competition. And this was the simplest game. I'm just in the pool, and they're jumping off the deck, and I'm throwing them passes, and they got to like lay out and dive to catch the ball. And then we like give them points based on how hard the catch was or whatever the case may be. And so he dives in the pool, and he doesn't, he, he is so competitive, it's not even funny, to a, a fault. This is a problem. And he didn't catch the ball. And he got so mad that he took his shorts off in the pool. <laughs> and then he gets out of the pool and stands on the deck. And he's just like, Ugh! and I'm like, what is wrong? Like, I'm trying to get his attention. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I rent my mantle like they did in the Old Testament. <laughs> And I'm like, you got bigger problems coming to you right now, pal. You put your pants back on and get yourself under control. I'm like, what are you doing? (sighs) That's our house. Pray for our family, seriously. (laughs) We need it. And I I bring that up because it really does give a good example. So often, even though we're doing the right things outwardly, our hearts are so far off. 
God's never been interested. God's never been concerned about our outward actions. He doesn't care about our emotional responses. And by the way, when we find ourselves in crisis, what do we often do? We get on our knees and we turn to God. We, we know where to turn to. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, God's holiness and, and, and that the, the way that we've been angry and mad at God before, the way that maybe we haven't believed him, all of a sudden that changes when we need him. We know where to turn, right? And we get on our knees and we cry out to God, you know, and maybe we'll make some temporary changes. Maybe we'll clean our lives up for a little while or whatever the case may be. Maybe there'll be an emotional response. Maybe we'll start going to church. Maybe we'll be good to our neighbors. Maybe we'll start trying. But can I tell you, God could care less about those outward actions. It's great that you're here today. But if you're here because somebody drug you along and your heart's not here, you're not getting any brownie points. It doesn't work like that. God cares about our hearts. And he says, rend your heart. Recognize the fact that he is holy. The day of the Lord is at hand. You might be going through something right now. Hey, we live in a sin-cursed world. We have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Make no mistake about it. Something is imminent. And there's an ultimate day. We're going to breathe our last breath. And we're going to stand in the presence of God. And he loves us. And he cares about us. And he wants a relationship with us. And he's crying out to us. And he's saying, rend your hearts. Stop being apathetic. Stop trying to live life on your own. Stop pursuing what you think is best for you. And humble yourself and get on your knees before your God and your creator. He made you. He loves you. He loves me. He, he knows what is best for us. And if we would give him our heart and our soul and say, God, I'm done living for myself. You can have me, all of me. I'm going to love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm done living for myself. I'm done being apathetic. I'm done being a complacent Christian. Here's my heart, my soul, my life. You can take it all. I come to you. Take me as I am. I'm broken. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. I don't deserve your grace. And when we do that... Oh, God's going to meet us there. And I promise you, he will open the windows of heaven. He will pour out blessings on your life. And here's how this message ends. At the end, he says, gather the people. Look at verse 15. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. This time they're blowing the trumpet for a different reason. He's saying, hey, there's an army and there's an enemy that's approaching but it's not too late. Blow that trumpet. Call it fast. Gather all the people. Look what he says in verse 16. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. I love that verse right there. He's saying get every single old person, get every single young person, even the nursing babies. And then he says, you know that, that, that uh, young man and that young woman that just got married? Interrupt their honeymoon and get them here. Something bigger is at stake. Something important. Gather all of the people. And then look what he says at the beginning of verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people. Underline that phrase, weep between the porch and the altar. This is such, oh, I love this right here. This is a nugget, something I learned this week. Do you know that between the porch and the altar was a place of atonement. You know that, that in the Old Testament, the, the, the porch represented the people, okay? And the, the people are here, and, and, and they, we need God. And the altar represents God in his presence. But between the porch and the altar, something drastic needed to happen because people in their sin can't just approach an almighty God. And so between the porch and the altar, something huge, something drastic needed to happen. In the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, you know what would happen? They would take two goats and they would bring them to the high priest. They would cast lots. On one of the goats, he would become the scapegoat. And the priest would lay his head on that scapegoat and he would pray over him and he would put the sins of the people on the scapegoat. There was a man waiting right off by the side and that man would grab that goat and he would lead him out into the wilderness and take him far, far, far away from the camp. And then he would let him go. And it was a picture of how that goat, that scapegoat would take our sins and how God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And then you know what happened to that other goat? That other goat was sacrificed. And his blood was shed because the punishment for sin was death. 
And you know what? Everything about the Old Testament sacrificial system, all of it pointed to one day when the ultimate Lamb of God would come and he would take away the sins of this world. And you know what Jesus is? He's both. He's the scapegoat. He takes all of our sins and all of our brokenness upon himself and he forgives us of all of them. And God doesn't see us in our sin and in our brokenness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And he paid for our sins with his own blood when he died on the cross in our place. Do you understand this morning that between the porch and the altar... Something drastic needed to happen. And you know where the priests and the ministers were supposed to stand? They were the ones that interceded on behalf of the people to God between the porch and the altar. And here's the practical application this morning for all of us. Weep in the gap. Weep in the gap. We have to understand we are the priests and the ministers. Do you know know that? When you got saved, we, we are a royal priesthood. We are the priests and the ministers. And you know what our job is to do? Our job is to stand in the gap. There is a world of people that is lost and dying and broken and in need of a savior. And there's a holy God in heaven who loved them and who paid the sacrifice. And God left us in the world as his priests and as his ministers to bridge that gap and to say, hey, listen up. There's a God in heaven. You better take him seriously. But he loves you and he died for you and he wants to save you. And you know what the call was to the priest here? Get in that gap. Get on your face and weep. God, spare thy people. This is why I say we we, we could not have a more fitting message for our church than a passage of scripture like this. Because God is good and God is blessing. And by the way, we we live in a different day and age than, than the Old Testament. We live in the day of mercy and of grace. And God is in the saving business. And what's happening in our church should be happening all, not just in this church, but all around the world when God's people get serious. But you know what we need to do? We need to stay broken. And we need to get on our faces. We need to weep because judgment is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. There's nothing that's stopping God from returning except his infinite and wise and holy plan. And mercy is available. You know what we as a church need to do? We need to gather. We need to get serious and not be comfortable and not be complacent and not not let passages like this wake us up. I, I love the prayer that was prayed. Look back in verse 17. Look about halfway through that verse. He says, let them say, spare thy people. Then he says, oh Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Now, I know that Israel was different from the church in the sense that this is a national prayer. Spare thy people so that you're not a reproach, so that the world doesn't say, well, where is your God? I thought you were God's people, but where is your God? But you know what? This is still so applicable for us today. And you know what? When we're weeping in the gap, we need to pray that the church would wake up. How many of you agree that the church needs to wake up? We need to wake up. Nothing that I said today is is hyperbole or just big language. It's just God's word. And there's real danger. There's real threats ahead. We need to wake up and we need to be sober and we need to be vigilant because we have an adversary, the devil, who walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to steal and he wants to kill and he wants to destroy. And we know that because we fight him every single day of our lives. But how often do we get on our face before God and we say, God, here's my heart. Wake me up. Help me to take you seriously. Help me to be passionate about about people and about them knowing you in a personal and intimate way. Then we need to pray that God would be seen. In many ways, there are so many people that that laugh at the church. Because you know what? The church, sadly, is often divided and we fight over frivolous things. And we're just as consumed with the American dream as the world's consumed with the American dream. And we're busy living our lives and building bigger houses and making better lives for our kids. Like we... If we're not careful, we can get sucked into that real quickly, can't we? And until we rend our hearts and until we get on our faces before God, until we get in that gap and weep for the people, 
We can't expect God to continue to just show his power and show his greatness and show his glory. And I'm telling you, God's doing something in our church. He's doing something special. He's doing something great. He's changing hearts and lives. Man, I I pray every week that when people drive onto our property, they would know that there's something different about this place. And I hear stories and testimonies week after week of how people continue to come back and how God's drawn into themselves. And that's great, but let's not stop. I believe God wants to do more and he can do bigger and he can do better even.